All right, let's get moving with some causal inference, another level of it anyway. Um, so th this is basically going to be a discussion about kind of the lim both the limitations of research and then how we move forward given those limitations because we've talked a lot about how um, and we can't draw certain conclusions and we kind of repeated that over and over and over and over throughout the quarter um, start talking about all the issues with research in general and all the threats to validity and those types of things so what we've got to do is how do, given all that stuff how do we actually move forward how do we actually make these types of decisions so um, and how do we believe in the science that we have um, and the science that we've come up with so we'll talk a little bit about that so <clears throat> the problem in general is that one randomized study is not going to generalize okay? and period we know that, right? Um, it's too local, right? Um, it's, it's too narrow, and, and we know that, that it's too local primarily because of the sampling issues that we've talked about in the past, focusing on the fact that you know, even if we were able to get, I mean, we, we try to get truly random samples, but it's, it functionally it's not going to happen. You know, we're, we need to make sure that every single person from the population has an equal chance of being selected. And population is just population of interest, right? Um, it doesn't mean the population of the United States, the population of the world, it just means the population of interest. But we also know that most people aren't going to be able to do that because they may not be available, they may not have time, they may not be in the selection pool, so on and so forth. They may not even want to participate, and we'll deal with that one in a little bit. Um, but So we have this, this major sampling problem. Right, and then the, lo the 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 local issue also ties in with the sampling problem, and, and the fact that okay, we've got this sample; it was supposedly randomized, um, but it's for here. It's for you know, if I'm doing the research in Cheney, it's it's from Cheney. You know, it's like okay, uh, that's not going to generalize necessarily to Seattle or to Alaska or something like that, uh, let alone to another country on another continent. And you know, so we have these sort of big problems that are uh, focused on randomized uh, with with randomized studies. Um, even though it's the best we've got, we still have those problems and. You know, part of this other issue here is that, um, for me, it's a really simple one. It's like, you know, we can deal with this just by replication, right? Um, and that's often what happens. And the, the, one of the other problems that we run into is the media tends to pick up on one article and um, they express the truth of the article and we found this, we found that. You know, I was just flipping through Google News a, a couple of minutes ago and saw that, you know, there's a study out now talking about violent TV shows keep kids awake. That's right. And next month there's probably going to be a show that says it put there, a, a study that says it puts them to sleep. And both studies are probably equally as valid. Um, so how do we draw these conclusions? Well, you have to be, you have to look at everything with a very critical eye and be skeptical and you kind of have to wait. You have to let the science play itself out. And uh, yeah, coming up here, we're going to start talking about meta analyses and how we can look at the overall scientific picture of a, a phenomenon or a problem or something. And we'll, we'll look at that stuff in a little bit. So we'll use those meta analyses to, to draw some conclusions. But let's continue on with this just problem of generalization. So what is to be generalized? I mean, specifically, we're talking about treatments, uh, you know, the independent variable, the outcomes, you know, do we get those same results with those same independent variables? Do we generalize across individuals? You know, I'm sure we've got a sample of a thousand people, but does that going to represent another thousand and so on and so forth? Um, the settings themselves, it, you know, is the context right? Um, sure, we can do this stuff in the lab, but can we pull it off in the classroom? Or sure, we can pull this off in the classroom, but can we pull it off in a hospital? You know, that type of thing. Right? Um, specifically speaking, we're also going to talk about construct validity. So the constructs that are associated with all of this stuff, so intelligence and those types of things that, that we're trying to measure, are those things valid? Are, are we measuring those properly? And do those generalize? You know, intelligence is one of those things that doesn't generalize across cultures, right? Uh, it, it, you know, it's a major problem with our measurement tools, multicultural assessment, right? That's a, speaking directly to this issue of generalization and construct validity. And of course, then there's external validity. You know, does this stuff, is it going to go outside of your study? Is it going to represent the real world, real people? Um, and we have to deal with all those things and we have to figure out a way to address it, right? And how do we work, or the, how do we work the logic around all these problems? Um, and how can we draw conclusions based on that logic? So. Let's look a little bit deeper into the sampling issues. Um, and I kind of already went over this, so I'm going to go over it a little bit quicker. Um, but we've got a couple of different techniques we typically use. And first off, of course, the sample must match the population in order for the logic to work. But 
we also know that it rarely does match the population, right? You know, people, you know, supposedly they have an equal chance of being selected, but that's kind of a bunch of hooey. There's really no way for everybody to have an equal chance of being selected, especially when we start thinking about uh, people can have the right to refuse to participate. And if the, once they refuse to participate, then your sample is biased. And that's one of the natural biases that exist in psychological research, or any medical research for that matter, is the, the patient or the client or the subject or the participant, whatever you want to call them, it, their right to refuse. And our science will never, ever represent people that refuse to uh, participate. I mean, why? Because we never find out you know, how they would react in that particular scenario or that, the, that setting. Um, because they're refusing to participate, and people like them refusing to participate. So, um, the method we've kind of been talking about the most is simple random sampling, where every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Again, there's the problems with actually pulling that off. Another thing that happens out there uh, that works fairly well, but there's you know it, it's another sampling technique. And there's problems with it, but it, it works probably as good as simple random sampling with fewer problems. Um, and it's called cluster sampling, which is where you identify clusters, right? So think of this as um, neighborhoods, right? Each neighborhood becomes a cluster. So we're gonna choose West Central or North Central or whatever, right? So we're gonna choose all these different neighborhoods and then randomly select a house from within the neighborhood. And that way we're not trying to randomly sample across individuals, we're trying to randomly sample across cultures and we're, or clusters. And we're trying to get that one cluster, you know, at least something random from that one cluster. Right, uh, and it works pretty well. You know, there's not really too much of a problem with it, but you still have the issue of getting the people to actually participate and contacting them and uh, accurately identifying your clusters and all those things. Right. So those are your two uh, your, your most desirable methods for sampling, and um, they they work, but they're hard to pull off. And as I've talked about before, you know, a, a random sample isn't really random, right? Um, what we're trying to do here. Uh, is make sure that everybody has an equal chance. Again, I've gone over this. Um, and people aren't going to, there's a lot of people that just don't want to participate. And the moment they choose not to participate, um, then they're going to bias your sample. That's a natural problem that exists, and there's no way around this one. This one is just, we're stuck with this one, right? Um, on top of that, after you've done your random selection, we've got to get into random assignment, right? Um, then once, they, once they're randomly assigned to a condition, they have to read their consent form and so on and so forth. And a lot of people actually refuse to participate once they've read the consent form because then they find out what they're, what's going to happen to them. And now you've ruined your random assignment and you've just destroyed an experiment all based on the rights and the ethics of the subject. And that's okay. You know, that's just what we've got to deal with. And um, there's really no way to get around those two very problems. And we just have to accept the fact they exist and work the logic around it. And we'll talk about that logic now. So what do we do? Right? Um, we look for four things. Basically, we look for categorical similarity. Right? Knowing that there's all these problems, knowing there's these sampling problems, assignment problems, and all those things, how do we draw conclusions and generalize this stuff to the general public? Um, right off the bat, we've got categorical similarity. Are people, are the people functionally the same? Are these from the same category of people? You know, if we've got a sample of people that are all low SES, well, they may not be a perfect representative sample of all people in the region that are in low SES, low, in low SES. but you know what, they're close enough, so probably going to generalize to them. Okay. Psychometrics. And so reductionism in separate, uh, reductionism to represent constructs. Basically just getting at here, are our psychometric properties, are, are those valid? Do we have, are we using the proper tool to assess the people? And if we are, uh, then it should work across multiple individuals um, because there's an entire field called psychometrics and we have psychometricians that their entire job is to come up with quality measurements. And the idea is to reduce all this down into one data set, right? So we've got, uh, we've got these powerful tools, like for example, the Beck Depression Index, it doesn't have that many questions on it, like 20 or 30 questions, something like that, and that supposedly represents depression. Well, it does it really well. Well, that's okay, you know, and so that works. Is it a perfect representation of depression? Probably not, uh, but it's kind of the industry standard and it works well. Intelligence is the same thing, those tend to be a bit bigger, um, but you know, how well do they work? Do they act, are they accurately measuring that construct of intelligence? Are we accurately measuring depression? Are we accurately measuring ADD, ADHD, all that stuff? So um, assuming our psych psychometrics are sound and that our validity and our reliability are high, then we're probably okay here, and that gives us some confidence. 
do we get those same findings over and over again? This is what I've talked about in the past with replication. The key, one of the big keys to science is replication. And if we can replicate something, then we get the same findings, then we're adding more confidence to it. Right? I've got two different things in here, systematic and direct replication. Direct replication is talking about redoing this study over again, basically. Right? Same population of people, don't change the independent variable, just a different sample, rerun the study. That's a, that's a very clean direct replication. Right? A systematic replication is where you start to tweak things just a little bit. Will it work with a different population? Will it work with a slightly different independent variable? For example, uh, we could think about a direct instruction method. Direct instruction works unbelievably well if you follow that independent variable to AT, if you do exactly what is said in there. So a systematic replication would be changing that intervention just a little bit. I wonder what would happen if we dropped a week off of the analysis, right? or a week off of the, the, the instruction, and then we would run our analysis and find out. So that's a systematic replication. We're going to do the same study, but we're going to tweak it just a little bit to see how far it extends. You know, what's that upper li the upper limit and lower limit of that uh, particular intervention? And this could be done with interventions. It could be done with dependent measures. It could be done with uh, um, uh, samples. It could be done with all sorts of stuff. Even different laboratories right? uh, running the same study over again as a type of systematic replication. And biology, do you know? This is one of those things that's great for behavior analysis that we'll talk about in the future. Is that behavior analysis is focused heavily on this biology thing, and where we've always demonstrated that our findings work across species. And because of the similarities across species, if we can show these similar effects across you know, psychological effects, behavioral effects, whatever they are, or medical effects, if we can show that across species, then we're confident that it's probably going to generalize to another person, right? So, for example, if I give you some particular drug and uh, your body reacts in X number of ways to that drug, I can reasonably predict that most bodies, most human bodies, are going to react the same way. Uh, and part of that is because of all the research that was done on other critters, right? How did they react? What did we learn about their cardiovascular system when we gave them this drug? And will that work for us? And if the answer is yes, then we're, again, if we're gaining some of that generalizability. Right? So those four things are really how we can kind of put this all in context. and. <laughs> understand our findings and, and, and try to generalize them. Um, there are five general principles that are based on these four categories um, that we use to apply all of these, that, that, we, that we apply to all of our findings. So let's flip through those. <coughs> Surface similarity, right off the bat. Do the findings look like they will generalize to a similar group? And when I say look, I just mean, is it the, the, do you get a feel? When you're looking at the data, does it feel like it's going to be right? This is just a feeling. It's not a, you know, this is not a hard scientific sort of thing. It's just kind of, and keep in mind that all sorts of stuff is counterintuitive, so maybe it doesn't look like it. So it, it, just because it doesn't look like it will generalize doesn't mean it won't. Um, so you do have to be a little bit cautious with these principles, but this is one of those things we look that we think about. Um, is it, do we have a reasonable, are we reasonably confident that this would appear again if we ran it in a different sample of people. Okay. We've got to rule out other irrelevancies. Okay. So for example, there's a million independent variables that could influence whether or not somebody learned their times tables. Is how much they weigh really one of those things? If not, then you know what? Let's not care. It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't make any sense why weight would uh, contribute to that. Now maybe it will, but we have to at least be realistic and go, all right, probably not, so let's just ignore the weight factor. We don't do it. Need, need to do a study on learning skills with kids that are uh, you know, obese versus kids that are in a normal weight range, right? So that's kind of an irrelevancy type thing. So we rule out those general irrelevancies if we can. Now keep in mind those are all empirical questions and they are testable, um, but we don't start off with testing all those little details. We start to test those details later on if we're finding that things don't generalize. Then we can ask the question, all right, well maybe it's weight, maybe it's height, maybe it's something else you know, that's, uh, that's affecting whether or not these kids are learning. But um, let's start with some of the big ones first. Like for example, are they getting the same quality of training from teacher A to teacher B? You know, there, there's a good one. That's not an irrelevancy, right? So we're not going to rule that one out. Does our research make the discriminations? We should know what won't generalize, right? So we need to find out exactly under what conditions will something happen and won't it happen. Right? We can teach kids to learn to read, but you can also teach them using very ineffective methods. That's a good thing to know, right? So we don't want to 
We don't want to go down that path of continually using ineffective methods. In other words, what will not generalize, right? What won't work? Um, and the other side of this coin is that, okay, we've got direct instruction, very effective method for teaching the kids, um, but will it work for, say, uh, teaching kids how to build a building? Or will it, you know, it works for math, it works for reading, there's been quite a bit of research saying it works for science. Um, does it work for, um, say, I don't know, some of the liberal arts, right? Um, does it work for social studies? Well, it could, you know, but we need to find out, right? Um, what, and then we would need to know what doesn't generalize, right? So if we say, hey, DI works for everything except fill in the blank, then we, we've learned something and we can talk about generalization. Uh, interpolation and extra, extrapolation uh, within groups and beyond our sample. So can we, can we generalize it to the same people? You know the same types of people and does it work across all the people in our group um, do we, in other words do we have a strong effect size um, and then how about beyond our sample is this going to work at the population level you know, can we extrapolate this beyond our data um, so statistics help with that sometimes other times they don't you know but this is just some of those things we have to deal with and causal explanation we need to think about I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant here because I'm not big on this fifth one here so bear with me but um, so the causal explanation can we develop and test theories based on these findings uh, the problem that I have with it is there's everybody's got a pet theory and they like to hang on to it forever even if it's been proven wrong um, and there's lots of in, uh, science out there that has had that happen uh, lots of cases in science that have had that happen throughout the years uh, so I'm a little bit less confident in this one, but it's still an important principle to say, okay, we've got this findings A, B, C, and D. Can we put those into a theory, and then can we test that theory? And if there's no underlying similarity across all our research, then all we have is just a collection of random facts, um, and that might be a problem. So if we can organize this stuff and come up with a general theory, if you will, um, then we can start to test things and uh, based on that theory and kind of move the science forward, and again, talking about generalization. So those five principles tend to get applied at all different levels, and we think about those principles in terms of applying them to meta-analytic findings, or applying them to a truly randomized finding, or to a single subject design finding, you know, those types of things. So we're gonna look at, we'll, we'll, you'll need to read the book and understand how these things are applied. I just kinda wanted to go over them a little bit with you. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have other methods for doing sampling, and keep in mind that these other methods aren't nearly as good as the simple random samples or the cluster sampling, uh, but they still tend to work. Right? So right off the bat, we've got purposive sampling. One of the most common types of things that we're going to deal that you're going to see out there, it's common, it's effective. We're going to grab a particular sample for a purpose. Um, we don't want to look at the effectiveness of some pregnancy drug uh, or pregnancy program support program for people that aren't pregnant. So we're going to focus just on pregnant people, right? So it's common and effective. There's two different types of uh, procedures that we can use for uh, purpose of sampling. Uh, number one is heterogeneous selection, right? So we'll go into that a little bit more detail here in a minute. Um, but primarily it just means that we're getting a group of people that are different, even though that there's a, a purposive sample to it, we're getting as many differences within that sample as possible um, to try and represent the entire population. So we're going to get people of high SES, low SES, high education, low education. Um, we're going to get all sorts of ages that are relevant for us. And we're just going to try and make it as broad of a sample as possible so then maybe we can generalize it to the population. Or we can focus on that typical instance type stuff, right? So instead of getting a heterogeneous, we're going to get more of a homogeneous type selection. We're going to focus just on the people that are that, that it's relevant for. It's like, okay, the typical instance of whatever X is is going to occur in this particular subpopulation of people, so we're just going to focus on that subpopulation. That becomes a purposive sample. It's not random by any means, at least at some level it's not random, and so it, it doesn't fit into those simple random categories. Um, so it is a purpose. We're done, done on purpose. We lose some of that randomness, but we're interested in those particular people. I tend to think of this as actually less like a sampling technique than a lowering of your, than a changing of your population of interest, right? Um, but that's a, a an argument that we could argue about forever. Anyway, all right. Purpose of sampling in more detail, right? So let's look at the typical instances uh, situations, right? So what we need is very clear definitions. We need clear definitions of settings, times, treatments, persons, outcomes. We need to define all that stuff ahead of time so we know who to choose, right? Um, in order to do that, we have to have a ton of existing data, right? So when will direct instruction work? 
at what time in the child's life, what type and how are we actually going to do direct instruction, for what people, and what's the outcome that we would expect. So we're going to have to really narrow this down. Um, and then in order to choose those people to participate in the study, we're going to have to have all that information about them. You know? uh, so we're going to have to have a lot of data ahead of time in order to select these folks. Heterogeneous actually uses the same types of procedures, believe it or not, um, but we're going to select differences of people on purpose like I talked about before. Clear definitions, again, settings, times, treatments, persons, outcomes. Um, do these things work across all those groups is the question that we're asking with heterogeneous selection. Rather than narrowing it down for one small subgroup, we're going to say, does this work across all these people? Does it work across all these instances? And if so, then you know, hey, we, we've done a decent job of not really creating randomness, but we've done a decent job of capturing that particular information and hopefully getting it to generalize to other people. Again, then we go back to those five criteria and the four criteria that were before that and see if we can apply those, those things to it and say, okay, yes, it's similar. Um, you know, hey, we ruled out irrelevant stuff, so yeah, I think this is probably going to work at the population, but let's replicate it just to make sure. So replication is really the key to all this stuff. So how do we actually study causal explanation, right? Uh, well, there's two general types of, uh, or th there's three general types of uh, criteria for focusing on how we actually gather this information and gather these, this data um, and then draw conclusions from it. One of them is qualitative, one of them is statistical, and one of them is experimental. Now, I can tell you right now, I hate the first two, all right? That's my bias. So I'm gonna present them to you, but know that I just generally think they're, well, I'll just put it bluntly. I generally think they're pretty useless. Um, there is some value in some of these things, but I tend to be much more quantitative and much more experimental in focus. And that's because of my background as an experimental psychologist and as a behavior analyst. Right? So ethnographic studies, there's quite a bit of information on ethnographic studies and, and that they can uh, provide you with some interesting information. Basically all we're trying to do is look at the context of the results. Um, what is that additional information that we can gather that wasn't directly about the numbers per se, right? So maybe you get this overall, hey, we've got a significant difference in our groups, but maybe it only worked for some people. You know, think of it this way. If you're shooting a rabbit, if you're shooting at a rabbit, right? Um, you, if you hit six inches too high the first time and miss the rabbit, and you shoot six inches too low the second time and miss the rabbit, well, guess what? Um, if you average that out, you killed the rabbit, but you ain't got nothing on your plate, right? So statistics can be a little bit misleading so sometimes we should focus on some of the other stuff here and this is one of the problems I have with statistical modeling and um, statistical control um, as opposed to direct observation of whether or not that whether or not you've got dinner on your plate right so um, ethnographic studies are going to look at that context of those individuals did this stuff work for these people did it not work for these people for me that's an interesting question because it um, it's a, it's actually a, qual a quantitative one I'm um, saying it did work for these folks it didn't work for these folks I'm going to try and see what what those differences are and then dig into it at a different level um, so I, I don't even treat that ethnographic stuff really as qualitative as much as what your authors do in the textbook um, but another way to do this stuff, open-ended interviews, um, and then, but we can code common answers. You know, we can ask people why, you know, I've done research in the high-risk behavior area for a long time, and we ask people, why did you engage in no condom use this week? And they, they can talk about that, right? They just, it's an open-ended question. And then what we do is start flipping through those answers and looking across all our subjects, oops, excuse me, looking across all the subjects and going, um, this is, you know, we, we see religion playing a role or we see um, alcohol playing a role and that type of thing. We just code stuff that way. So we, in a sense, we turn it quali uh, quantitative. Okay. Statistical modeling is another technique that is very popular today. It's almost in vogue, right, um, to use structural equation modeling. Uh, you know, there's other methods out there um, that do this stuff, but um, it, this SEM is probably the most common that I've been seeing in the literature. You'll see it a lot. Uh, there's a decent section in your book on it, and you'll see that a ton when you actually dig into the real the school psych literature, and you see what you know what's being done. How do we explain why this child is engaging in this behavior? Why are they failing in math? And they have all these fancy statistical models. Basically, all they did was a bunch of correlations. That's it. And as we know, correlation is not causation. And what they're doing, you know, what authors that use SEM are doing is they're they're teasing apart these effects, and they're doing a great job. It's it's pretty it's pretty powerful statistical tools. I'm um, saying, okay, this you know variable x contributes to variable y. We can rule out variable z, and we can do that mathematically, and we can remove its effect from, um, and then see how much is left and how much of the variance is left over uh, for x and y to account for each other, and so on and so forth. But don't forget. That it's all correlation. 
this is not causal, right? And I think when we make those pretty flow charts and all the arrows and the weights and all those things on those uh, on those arrows, it looks impressive. But you cannot forget that those weights are just simply correlations, and that we uh, that although the author may be drawing it uh, with a directional arrow, it can always be redrawn with an arrow going the opposite direction. We do not know with any type of this stuff which is coming first, which isn't. We don't. It's a chicken or egg type question. It's a correlation. We can't predict that. Uh, that that that. We can't predict that direction, if you will. But trust me, people will try, uh, and it's it's frustrating to know from a causal perspective that they're not really they're just pulling sm it's smoke and mirrors. Um, it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to it. It's informative stuff in the sense that ooh, okay, these two variables seem to be contributing to this, but don't think that they're causing it because there could be something else that the authors didn't measure. On top of that, not only did they may have forgotten to measure something, but they have measurement error in each one of those measurements. You know, we've talked about that before. We've talked about um, variance accounted for with correlation. We've talked about um, um, error variance. We've talked about all those problems that we can come up with with the mean, right? And so the, how accurate is the mean? Um, is it not accurate? Is it accurate? All that stuff, right? So that's all measurement error stuff, and that's all embedded in there. You don't see it because, of course, they're not going to highlight, you know, not going to give you little numbers and make it really obvious for you how much measurement error is there. But you can find it. It's in the articles, or you can derive it based on some of the content that's there. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're looking at all those fancy statistical techniques and uh, the stuff in the articles is that it, it is a correlation and there is measurement error as well. So take it with a grain of salt, let it inform you, but don't, uh, don't treat it as gospel, so to speak. Right. Experimental manipulation, no one questions that hands down this is the best way to come up with cause and effect stuff. Uh, it's, is it empirical? You, know, you, 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 know, you can't fix your design problems with fancy statistics. No way to do it, right? Um, you, the qualitative may be informative. It gets you to ask more questions, maybe, but it doesn't answer cause. Right? Now, you want to know what caused the behavior uh, or the problem in the kiddo? Well, you're going to have to do some type of experimental manipulation. You're going to have to study it at that level, and there's no way around that. And I think our society often forgets that, and we tend to look at a lot of this research and go, ooh, 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 we figured out that whatever causes cancer, and like, okay, that's great, but all you have is a fancy correlation. You have a fancy statistical model. Don't forget that there may be something else to it, and if we can't do the experimental manipulation, then we're not going to have that very clear-cut answer. So for me, experimental manipulation is really the strong way to go. Uh, and it really gets at the cause and effect stuff. And the other stuff is useful and informative, um, but you're not going to get many treatments that are based on qualitative or statistical modeling. You're going to get treatments that are based on experimental manipulation. Um, so you want to fix a problem, you want to understand the problem, you go experimental. The other two methods are going to be informative and maybe lead you to making better decisions about how to do your experimental manipulation. And that's kind of the way I think about it. All right, we'll come back and talk about more stuff soon.